Hello and welcome to another Gen Z for Green Deal podcast episode by Projects in Motion Limited in Malta. The Gen Z for Green Deal Erasmus Plus project aims to develop a training and capacity building program for young people to actively participate in the development of their local community and environment and encourage young people to think more actively about sustainable development, environmental protection and other green topics. My name is Stefan and today I have with me again Dr. Brian Restor. For those of you who have just tuned in, Brian is a sustainability expert working for the local NGO Malta Regional Development and Dialogue Foundation. Brian, in the last episode we spoke about the barriers to sustainable development and explained some key necessities to overcome these. We also spoke about social acceptance as a prerequisite for sustainable development initiatives. Today we will dig a bit deeper into the issue of public participation in sustainable development and how it can help to empower people to take a more active approach. Can you help us entangle the different public participation terms and name some of the important precursors to meaningful engagement? There are obviously many different ways of engaging with stakeholders ranging from actually actively being part of the decision-making process to simply being heard and involved in part to just being informed about what is happening and in other extreme cases also uh, being manipulated through public participation. Uh, let me put it this way, today uh, public participation is typically rooted in the belief that individuals and communities who are directly affected by a particular decision or policy uh, have a right to be actively involved in shaping that decision. So that is the departure point, the, the original definition. It is a bit more than just you know soliciting opinions. It's really a much more comprehensive two-way sort of collaborative process aimed at achieving better more informed and widely accepted decisions. The, the utility, of, or utility of public participation can be justified quite easily, but typically under four main headings. First of all, public participation is itself a process of democratization, since it promotes inclusivity in decision-making, ensuring that the diverse voices from society are also heard, and this inclusivity is a fundamental aspect of democratic, democratic governance, if you like, since it kind of prevents the concentration of power in the hands of a few and hopefully fosters a more equitable society. Another second important purpose of public participation is that of accountability. Uh, decision makers are accountable to the people they serve. So public participation kind of strengthens accountability by um, following citizens to hold decision makers responsible for their actions and decisions. And this supposedly ensures that decisions are made in the best interest of the public rather than uh, just a select few. A third argument for public participation is that of creating legitimacy in projects or policy. When the public is actively involved in decision-making processes, it, it enhances the legitimacy of those decisions. And people are much more likely to trust and accept decisions when they've had a say in shaping them, sort of. It's about building trust, credibility, which in reality are essential for the successful implementation of most policies and projects. We could talk about another fourth purpose of public participation, which is that of um, fostering information exchange, uh, knowledge transfer. It ensures that uh, citizens have access to, to data, relevant data uh, that bears on the project, expert opinions, uh, the rationale behind decisions, etc. So uh, that information exchange uh, makes sure that citizens can indeed provide some sort of valuable insight and feedback and uh, should lead to more well-informed decisions. Public participation in its own way kind of creates a feedback loop that allows for continuous improvement in decision-making. 
It also helps uh, decision makers gauge the public sentiment on that specific issue, identify potential issues a priori, and possibly adapt policies or plans accordingly. I, finally, I would say that public participation also supports conflict resolution, and that is a, an important pillar in my mind. Uh, many of these conflicts and disputes arise from decisions that neglect the concerns and perspectives of affected stakeholders, there's no doubt. It, in many ways, public participation also provides a platform for uh, addressing these kind of conflicts by allowing stakeholders to voice their uh, concerns, their grievances, propose alternatives, and possibly find uh, mutually acceptable solutions in true dialogue. There's no doubt that involving the public in, uh, in the early phases of decision-making processes can really identify potential conflicts and possibly address them proactively right at the onset without letting them simmer into the, into the consultation process. And this helps prevent a lot of disputes from escalating into costly and difficult conversations down the line. That was very interesting, Brian. So, in summary, part, public participation is a cornerstone of democratic governance and good decision-making. It not only empowers individuals and communities to have a say in matters that affect their lives, but it also enhances the quality and legitimacy of decisions. Are there uh, other public participation terms that we should be aware of? Yes. Yes, sure. As I mentioned before, there's quite uh, a few terms which are used and often overlap. And I'll try and clarify a bit the confusion, maybe. So we, we've established the idea of public part participation at a ger generic level. Then uh, perhaps it would be a good idea to make a distinction with actual stakeholder engagement. Stakeholder engagement is the operation, operational and active involvement of individuals or groupings. Uh, seeking to address public concerns or influence policy changes within their community. It's, it's the, the operative part of public participation. And um, this engagement or involvement uh, encompasses both political and non-political avenues. It's, it's more encompassing. Uh, also revolves around shared interests that drive interaction with government ent entities in order to advocate for specific changes. So basically when you have a critical mass of public engagement and you manage to establish it in the, this in the context of sustainability projects for instance, it can definitely lead to higher representation and uh, even higher voter turnout in support of sustainable development initiatives. So uh, that's why in many ways stakeholder engagement is very important because in reality it's a very good vehicle to exerting more uh, significant pressure on politicians and the relevant authorities. There is strength in numbers obviously and stakeholder engagement tries to bring those numbers together to, to have critical mass and to have meaningful uh, feedback and engagement. Uh, it's also important to, to keep in mind that stakeholder engagement differs very significantly also from stakeholder management, for instance, simply because uh, stakeholder engagement implies that there is a willingness to listen and adjust actions based on stakeholder input. Stakeholder management, on the other hand, is trying to actually manage that stakeholder in a way that might not necessarily imply that there is a listening component to it, but just a means to an end. Um, having said all this, despite the importance of involving the public in, uh, in planning, for instance, or sustainable development initiatives, it still remains a big challenge to do this properly. Uh, and let's put it this way, existing uh, approaches today tend to focus mostly on informing or hearing from the public rather than actually actively involving them, participating in, in the process, in the planning process. 
And this in many ways just limits their influence on the broader planning process because they've just been informed uh, rather than uh, committed to participate. To try and maybe distinguish meaningful engagement from other forms of public involvement, you need a number of elements that could come into play, for instance. Uh, meaningful engagement would require that you provide sufficient advance notice of the engagement activities, how the processes are going to work, uh, ensuring that information is clear and accessible to the general public, something that they can actually align with and uh, sympathize with, establishing reasonable timelines for participation, using appropriate levels of engagement uh, for the specific context. Each project is different, so even their uh, specific engagement methodologies might be more suitable for that particular context. It's obviously important to recognize and respect the values of the public and stakeholders because ultimately they are living there, they are affected, and uh, also uh, adopting an engagement process that can accommodate participant needs. So if you're dealing with seniors, for instance, you, the engagement process needs to take uh, cognizance of issues like digital divide, uh, reading limitations, language barriers, technological barriers, etc. And at the same time, you need to ensure transparency in the way you communicate results and, and make sure that you build trust with those same communities. So, I don't know, while effective engagement can bring numerous benefits to the planning and research process, it's essential to really approach it critically. There is no one fit for all consultation processes. Understanding, for instance, the motivations behind the engagement is, is critical also, because it kind of shapes the framework that you're going to adopt in that engagement effort specifically. And even different approaches can give you different outcomes. So if you don't manage them carefully and honestly, they could just literally reinforce existing privileges or merely serve as a rubber stamp for predetermined projects. So there are also a lot of different levels that help us distinguish between uh, truly participative engagement and other less involved forms. And we need to be very savvy on the way we're being engaged and not, uh, not hesitate to push back when the level of engagement is purely formal, box checking. Yeah. We need to remain vigilant on that respect and make sure that we are being involved properly. Can you break down the different stakeholder involvement levels for us? Sure. So, engagement levels in, uh, in stakeholder engagement uh, typically represent a, a huge spectrum of approaches with uh, varying degrees of participation, as I mentioned earlier. At the lowest level, we can inform the general public or simply provide information on the project, where the interaction is purely one way, and simply informing, uh, information sharing basically with stakeholders without seeking their input, making it a completely non-participatory approach, even though it's sold as being participatory. That for me is the lowest denominator of actual stakeholder engagement. Another type of stakeholder engagement is that of actually consulting, where you involve stakeholders by asking their opinions and, uh, and provide you with information but without granting them direct decision-making power. Uh, then we could also look at uh, another uh, spectrum, and that is involving. And the level of involving goes a step further, because here we're trying to enable stakeholders to actually participate in the discussions and uh, influence the decisions. So even though they may not have the final say, at least they are involved in the discussion and decision-making. Then on, on another uh, 
level, if you like, we could talk about um, participatory methods that uh, involve collaboration and empowerment, where uh, this really represents the highest level of engagement, but in many cases remains still aloof. It's a difficult thing to actually achieve, but nowadays it's starting to pick up immensely. Uh, here in, in what I mean by collaborating and uh, and being empowered, it's really about working with the stakeholders very closely, with the project teams, and in a cooperative, genuine manner. Um, we could also try and empower stakeholders as well, uh, where you actually give them full involvement in decision making, uh, often with facilitation to even lead on to these decisions, making it the most participatory approach. But again, this is still a bit of a difficult thing to achieve in view of what's going on in our cities. But I think this is slowly gaining ground and will be the way forward, where we actually collaborate and empower communities to actually run sustainable development projects themselves on the lead. Recently, there has been much buzz about a new term called co-creation. Can you explain a bit to us what this means in the context of stakeholder engagement for sustainable development? Okay, um, I'm glad that you raised the issue of co-creation. Again, uh, this is actually quite uh, different from public participation or stakeholder engagement, uh, even though it's not obvious. And, and that's why I'm emphasizing a bit on these definitions. Co-creation is actually a new approach to, to developing urban spaces jointly and uh, sustainably between urban planners, professionals and, and citizens, sort of. It can be, co-creation sort of can be defined as the sharing of information and ideas among stakeholders, um, but still allowing for uh, participation, engagement and empowerment basically uh, allowing them to uh, allowing the public to develop policies create programs improve services tackling systemic changes etc with each dimension of society being represented right at the onset i mean so co-creation is a very interesting concept and uh, it really helps build upon the cultural and political values of affected urban communities while also embedding collaboration in the very design of urban projects and looking at people as proactive citizens capable of, of making culture changes over the long term. I mean, it's, a, it's quite a citizen-centered approach and uh, Co-creativity kind of can really help people uh, form and promote their own decisions, manage them, create new stakeholder mapping, build capacity for self-government and also develop open-ended civic process. So it's quite an exciting new development, if you like. Uh, what also distinguishes co-creation uh, from other participation initiatives is that the, the stakeholders are really involved right at the very beginning of the decision-making process, integrated into the framework and even starting at the identification of the problem phase, for instance. It also kind of offers opportunity for integration of different participatory tools and processes and in many ways can also help reduce uh, costs and increase stakeholder satisfaction. So I would say co-creation is an exciting new space that uh, needs some efforts to, to be integrated in our development control and sustainable practices. Thank you very much, Brian, for these valuable insights. That uh, brings us to the end of this third podcast episode about the different forms of public participation. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And uh, of course, you can find further information about the Gen Z for Green Deal project on our website and on our social media channels. Until next time, take care. <laughs>